Okay, so we are <coughs> at breakneck speed. We are now into Matthew chapter 2. One down, 27 to go. So we come to chapter 2. We're still in the nativity passages, and we're probably actually going to slow down a little bit more here because as we come into chapter 2, <coughs> pardon me, there are multiple Old Testament references right the way through this. And again, there are the obvious ones. There are the ones when we're told that this is Old Testament being fulfilled. And then there is also the ones that are somewhat less obvious. And uh, the obvious one as we come to this passage is the Bethlehem of Judea, Micah. And we're not actually even going to get that far today. We're going to have to have a little look further back. But let's begin and let's see what we can glean from this passage that is so familiar and yet in another sense so unfamiliar. Um, do any of you remember when, uh, you know, from Christmas services, Christmas carols and what have you, do you remember the old Christmas carol that says, we three kings of Orient are? Something like traveling, uh, bringing gifts, traveling afar, something like that. And then, of, of course, star of wonder, star of light was the refrain, the chorus, as it were. Well, that's a very well-known Christmas carol. We three kings of Orient are. And it is completely inaccurate, which is why we don't sing it ever, because it's just wrong. First of all, they weren't kings. Secondly, there were kings in the passage, and the passage is about kings, but they weren't kings. Secondly, there weren't three of them. And thirdly, whoever they were and how many there were, they didn't come from the Orient. We, we today may think of Asia as being the land of the East, but that was not how it was viewed in biblical times. And so uh, that is a hymn, uh, a carol to consign to the uh, recycle bin. Uh, in computing terms and then empty it from there and never return to it again. We are going to look at what actually happened after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. So now we have our timing. The timing is clear that it's after Jesus was born. We're now a little bit further in time. And if you want to know how much further in time, we can tell historically how much further in time because Herod is, is king. And there's other clues in the text. There are clues in the text with regards to the word child being used of Jesus, a different word than was used previously, indicating he's somewhat older. And at the end of chapter 2, when Herod decides that he is going to slaughter this young child and to make sure he gets him just slaughter all the rest of them as well, then he does so of a certain age. And he tries to understand how, when the uh, Magi began their journey. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But all of that is to say that at this point, Jesus is not a little baby. He is, in fact, nearer to what we would call a toddler. So as well as throwing out we three kings of Orient are, you perhaps want to put some sort of time gap in your nativity scene, separating the shepherds from the, the Magi who never actually met each other because their arrival was, was probably a couple of years apart, at least a year. So, so there's all sorts of misunderstandings that come with this passage. There's lots of things that we, don't, that we thought we knew that are wrong, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we didn't know at all, and there's other stuff that we didn't even know to ask. So we know it's now after Jesus was born in, in, uh, in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, and now we come, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And this is what they said. Right. So who are these people and where do they come from? First of all, where did they come from? The east was not Asia. There was, there was not a transport coming from there on a regular basis. But rather, the east was the other side of what was called the Fertile Crescent and would be across in what would be today modern-day Iraq, perhaps modern-day Iran, that kind of area. And because a de direct line journey from, uh, from the uh, Mesopotamia, as it was called, that area, that region, to Jerusalem was straight through wilderness, that people would travel the long way round through, as I said, what was called the Fertile Crescent. They didn't have cars. Uh, I, I seem to remember as a kid 
singing that We Three Kings of Orient Art and putting in, you know, how schoolboys would kind of play around with the words to make them funny. I remember something about a Yamaha and it was about boat motorbikes and stuff. But they didn't come that way. They didn't come on anything other than, than on horseback. And it would have been a long, slow journey. And the journey would have taken well over a year, which is why they're late to the party. They left almost certainly at the time that Christ was born, but it's taken them that long to get here. So that's where they came from. The next question we need to have is, who are they? What on earth are Magi? Well, Magi, if you think of Magi as being short for magicians, you're not too far off. Magi were Babylonian scholars that sort of in the ancient world were a halfway house between what we would call astronomy and what we would call astrology. And if you think that the astrology mention makes them sound a little bit dodgy, as we would say in England, then they were more than a little bit dodgy. Magi were people who would look at signs in the stars and they would sort of follow the patterns of the stars and try and predict the future. It involved magic, it involved uh, incantations, it involved all sorts of things like that. They were essentially sorcerers, soothsayers, and these kinds of things. That all of those kind of things that we would consider to be occultic came under the, the banner of the Mesopotamian Magi. So I've answered your questions, but in doing so, I've probably given you about a hundred more. Because what we need to know now is we need to know why, how, when, what, how is it that Babylonian occultists knew to come to Jerusalem to follow a star at that particular time, because presumably there are stars at other times as well, and to come that far, and then in doing so, on arrival, they come and they want to worship Jesus, who is king of the Jews. I mean, worship is a strong word, right? They don't want to come and, and pay homage to the king. They don't want to come and say congratulations to the king. They want to worship the king. How on earth do Babylonian astrologers know that there is a God-man who will grow up to be the king of Israel who has just been born and they found the location via a star? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us. And normally at this point, I would just say, well, that's not Matthew's focus, so let's just press on with the text. But I understand that at this point, if I were, to, uh, if I were not to answer the questions that are inherent for us, um, that, that perhaps be some form of revolt and I should get in all sorts of trouble. So I will answer these questions. But let me just say this. I don't think that predominantly this is Matthew's main point. I think Matthew has got sort of other ideas that theologically that he's trying to push to us in this text. But let's read a little further before we answer some of those questions. There's a few other details I want us to get. Firstly, they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews, as we mentioned? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So there they were in the east. They see a star. And for some reason, they recognize that this star that they see means they need to go and worship this, this God-man, king of the Jews, and come and worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now, once we've done our Old Testament detour this week, we're going to come back to this text more next week. And we'll do another Old Testament detour next week as well. But I want us to notice just a couple of things here. Firstly, this bothers Herod. Herod was in the business of, of quashing not just revolts, but rumors of revolt. Herod, was, Herod would kill his own family members because he thought that somebody, you know, somebody had whispered, hey, did you know that so-and-so is planning on a revolt? Boom, dead. I mean, he was paranoid to the nth degree. And so for him to be troubled, and we're going to see that, obviously, because by the end of this, he, he doesn't know how to isolate that one particular child, so he's just going to kill them all. That way we'll be sure to kill the one that we want. He was a very wicked man. He was an evil man, and he caused great harm to Israel through the slaughter of the innocents. We'll come to that in the coming weeks. 
The other thing to notice is not only was Herod, uh, Herod troubled, but all Jerusalem with him. Now, we are not told by Matthew how many magi arrived. We know now they're magi, they're not kings. There is a king, it's Herod, and he's very important, and we're going to talk more about him in a minute. But uh, these magi, we don't know how many came. What we do know, though, is that their arrival did not just trouble Herod. That makes sense. They come in, they ask for the king of the Jews, they get sent to the palace, they get an audience with Herod, and then he gets troubled by the message that they bring. That makes sense. He's paranoid. But why would all of Jerusalem be troubled? My only solution to that is to suggest to you that there were a large number of them. And we'll talk more about that at the end. But I'm, I, I personally think there were probably at least hundreds of them. A massive entourage arriving in the city looking to worship the king of the Jews. And so Herod then gathers the chief priests and the scribes and inquires of them where the Christ was to be born. Herod was a king. He was in charge of that region under Roman rule. Uh, we'll talk more about him perhaps next time, but um, he was, I, I believe he was a nominally Jewish, a convert, uh, but he wasn't a man of faith even remotely. And therefore he has to check with those who do know their scripture as to where the Messiah was to be born. Can you notice just how effortlessly, effortlessly it goes from King of the Jews to the Christ, the Messiah? In the Jewish frame of reckoning, they understand that Messiah is the king. They know who is being spoken of. There's a king of the Jews to be worshipped, that'll be the Messiah. And again, we spoke about this last time and the time before with the virgin birth. We spoke about how with that whole section of Isaiah, that the concept of there being one who was born a man, born a baby from a virgin who was also God and should be worshipped as God is very, very clear in the early chapters of Isaiah. When the, when the liberal theologians come along and say, oh, you know, I'm not sure that the deity of Christ was a New Testament concept. I think it was started in the early church. We, the one thing we do agree with them on, it didn't start in the New Testament. It starts in the Old Testament. You can argue the deity of Christ from the Old Testament alone. In fact, you can do so from multiple books in the Old Testament without referring to the other ones. It's a very clear thing. That's why John's prologue is what it is. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's not introducing some radical theology. He's just summarizing aspects of the Old Testament. But I'm not teaching John, so we'll leave that for now. Maybe for Christmas. But anyway... So what we have then here um, is we have this, uh, them coming to Bethlehem to worship the Christ, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, the God-man. All of those things are contained with the words worship Christ and King of the Jews. And they're told where to worship and they're, going, they're to go and see him in Bethlehem of Judea because the prophet Micah said that's where he was to be born. Now... We've got a lot to cover today, so we're not going to get to Micah. We're going to do Micah next week. But for us to answer the questions that are pressing upon us with regards to the Magi, we need to look at another couple of passages. There's one passage that is alluded to in this section that might not be immediately obvious to us. Sometimes you get straight quotes. Sometimes you get allusions, which is when you have um, words, phrases, concepts that are pretty strong. So we say, ah, he's pointing me over here without an actual quotation. And sometimes the allusions blend into echoes. And maybe they're not quite as clear as they should be. Um, I think this one is perhaps you know, borderline echo illusion. But maybe to the Jews it would have been clearer and it would have been uh, an allusion to them. They would have picked up on this. But look at what's happening here. There is a king, a wicked king. And he is a wicked king and he is about to, to do a lot of harm to Israel. And this wicked king is paranoid. And so the wicked king has a conversation with with as I say, um, uh, Babylonian magi, 
he has a conversation with Babylonian Magi and he asks for them to do something for him. Now we're going we're gonna to see that more next time when we come later, but if you just go ahead a little bit now, he said he sent them to Bethlehem in verse 8 and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him, a.k.a. kill him. So that's, that's Herod's plan. So here is Herod, a wicked king, dealing with Israel, having interactions with a Babylonian magi, with, with, sorry, with Babylonian magi, plural, and trying to do great harm to Israel by killing their Messiah. That's what's going on, right? We can all see that in the passage. A few nods of heads. I feel we're there together. Good. All right. Where else in the Bible do we see a wicked king, not of Israel, interacting with Israel, seeking assistance from Babylonian magi, seeking to cause great harm to Israel? And I'm sure at this point, you're all immediately thinking, that's Numbers 24, Anthony, and you would be right. So let us turn to Numbers 24. Numbers 24. And, and, and again, it may seem subtle to us, but Matthew is writing to people who are, who are absolutely entrenched in Judaism. There's parts of Matthew that only make sense when you understand not only Mosaic law, but you understand the, 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 the present day at their time, rabbinical interpretations of Mosaic law. And, and so Matthew has a very high expectation of an understanding of his audience, that his audience would know the scriptures, know the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish ways, the rabbinical tendencies, and passages like Numbers uh, 22 through 24, which, are, which is where we are now, would have been very well known to his audience. So I think that the illusion would have been understood and seen better by them than necessarily by us. us. Now, we'll, we'll get to 24 in a minute. Um, I'll get there a little bit after you, actually, because I just turned to Deuteronomy 24. <laughs> so, you'd think I'd be a little bit more organized, but I never cease to disappoint you. Right, okay. So in, in Numbers 22, let's just go back a little bit for context. In Numbers 22, we have the passage where Balak summons Balaam. Balak summons Balaam. Verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of chapter 22, the sons of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Okay, context. What is going on here is that we are still in the wilderness wanderings. Here in this, um, in this uh, passage, in this section rather, we have the, um, the Jews in the wilderness. They have just been condemned to spend another generation there. They went to Kadesh Barnea, they looked across to the promised land, they sent spies into the land, and as you recall, the spies come back and say, man, these guys are giants, which by the way, they literally were descendants of the Nephilim, and we're like grasshoppers next to them, and we're not going to win, this is just crazy. And so they, God comes into judgment with them there, and they are not able, that generation, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, who were the spies bringing back a good report, uh, with a, a positive sort of we can do this uh, tinge to it, then um, apart from them, the generation won't stay, won't get to go into the land. However, there were what we call sorties into the land. There were times when they went into the land and did a little bit of attacking, but they weren't able to enter to go into there. They just killed off some of the tribes that were there. And again, these were Nephilim and sons of the Nephilim. If you remember the Nephilim from Genesis 6, when the sons of God uh, slept with the daughters of men, and there was this weird quasi-demon human offspring called the Nephilim that later became known as the Rephaim because there was one particular tribe that was renowned for its Nephilim. 
Um, it's kind of like when you want to Xerox something. You mean you want to copy it, but you use the brand name because it becomes well known. Rephaim became shorthand for the Nephilim. And in Deuteronomy 3, we see that Moses kills Og, king of Bashan, who is the last of the Rephaim. He was the last one. But nonetheless, those, those Nephilim have reproduced and their offspring have reproduced and there are giants in the land and it goes on for quite some time and that's when we get to Goliath, which you're probably aware of. So all of that to say is that the Amorites had issues with Nephilim and they were taken out and now he looks at Moab and the Moab, uh, the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now we know what's going to happen with Jericho, but not now, next generation. But Balak doesn't know that. And Balak is the king there, uh, and he is someone who is concerned. And so what happens is uh, Balak he sends the elders uh, of Midian, and they go and find a gentleman who is known as Balaam. You will know Balaam. He is the man with the most famous ass, by which, of course, I mean donkey. He is the one who had a talking donkey, and that's why he's famous. Lots of people know that story, but they don't really know why. This is why. Because Balak, king of Moab, sends the elders to go and do his duty. They go and get Balaam, and Balaam is what? Have a wild guess. He is a Babylonian magi. Why on earth do you get a Babylonian Magi when you're worried about being attacked by the army of the Israelites? And the answer is they had a bigger army than he did. He needs supernatural help. And so what he does is he calls Balaam. And why Balaam in particular? Because Balaam was a particularly powerful Magi. And he had a reputation that whomever he cursed was cursed. If Balaam issued a curse over you, then you would be cursed. And so, with that high reputation, Balaam was hired and he is sent out. And so, when we come a little further on, Balaam is on his way. He has an incident with a donkey. We'll leave that for another day. But by the time we get to Numbers 23, he gives his first prophecy. You say, prophecy? Why does the heading in the Bible say first prophecy? Wasn't he supposed to curse? Oh yes, he was supposed to curse. And every time he opened his mouth to curse, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, took control of Balaam and he prophesied when the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament worked very differently than he does in the New Testament. In the New Testament, everyone who is a Christian has the Spirit of God within them. In the Old Testament, that wasn't the case. Sometimes the Spirit would come and then go, Sometimes the Spirit of God rushed upon someone, like last minute, like Samson. It was like he didn't really like Samson. Oh, no, they've got to go to Samson. Oh, you know, and rushed on and rushed away again. Samson was a, was a man with all sorts of Im immorality in his life. And others, like David, he was with for a long period of time. But even David was aware that it wasn't permanent. He'd seen his mentor, as it were, Saul, lose the Holy Spirit. And then God sent him an evil spirit. And so when David was caught out with his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, when he prays his prayer of repentance, he prays, take not your Holy Spirit from me. It was a very real possibility for David. And by the way, I know there is a Keith Green song based on that psalm, and we don't sing that either because that's not applicable today because we are new covenant believers and God's Holy Spirit will not ever leave us. In fact, God says he is your deposit, your down payment, guaranteeing your future redemption. And so, so there were different times. So this, this Babylonian magi, the spirit of God comes upon him, he opens his mouth to curse Israel, and he ends up prophesying. And he didn't just do that once. He does it once, and, and, and Balak says, what on earth are you doing? Why are you doing this? Be more careful. So, so he goes back a second time, and it happens all over again, and then a third time, and then just for far good measure, he then does it a fourth time. And it is when we get to the fourth and final prophecy in Numbers 24, verse 15, that we get to the passage that we are interested in. Because what we have is a very, very similar situation. As I've said, pagan king interacting with Israel, uh, seeking assistance from Babylonian magi to cause great harm to Israel. 
And what happened last time that happened? What happened is there were these prophecies. And the last one goes something like this. Verse 15. Then he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is uncovered, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who knows the knowledge of the Most High, who beholds the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes opened. I, I'm going to be on my best behavior here and not try and get distracted and do a sermon on the prophecy here. But if you want to look at it more in your, for your homework, it seems the first time he expects to curse and then something else happens. And by the time we come here, he's almost sort of reveling in the fact that he has oracles from God. Verse 17 and, and look at this is referring to, the context of 16. The, he, has, he beholds a vision of the Almighty. He knows the knowledge of the Most High. So what is it that he knows? The knowledge of the Most High. Who's that? That's God. What is it that he sees? He sees a vision of the Almighty. That's God. And so verse 17, I see him, but not now. Now that's a bizarre phrase. It's almost as if he sees him, but recognizes that the time that he sees him is in the future, is not his current time. That is very common in, in, in uh, Bible prophecy and visions. We saw that in Daniel, where Daniel is taken to a different time. When we look at that most famous of visions, Isaiah chapter 6, which we kind of keep referencing um, in recent weeks, in Isaiah 6, Isaiah has this vision of the Lord high and lifted up on his throne in the temple. And we know from the context of Isaiah in the preceding chapters that the temple is on the earth, on Mount Zion. He's not in a temple in heaven, but rather Isaiah is taken into a future time when Jesus will rule and reign on a throne on earth. That's the context of Isaiah 6. So he was taken to another time. And I suspect that's what's happening here with Balaam. So he sees him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Which at first glance looks to be repetitious. We get these parallelisms in, in Hebrew poetry, which are sort of synonymous, but not exactly. And there's sort of a distinction there. And I think here it talks about being a different place geographically. Because, of course, this is prior to them coming into the land. Different time, different place. But this is what he sees when he sees the Almighty. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession Seir, its enemies, will also be a possession while Israel performs valiantly. Oh, I just want to spend the rest of our time. In the, I can't. There's other things to do. But this is a glorious passage. He sees the Almighty. And what does he see? Well, you can see the reference here from Matthew 2. He sees a star that comes forth from Jacob. In other words, his vision of the Almighty is associated with a star. Talk more about that in a minute. But also it's associated with another S word, a scepter. If any of you followed the uh, funeral of Queen Elizabeth, apparently two thirds of the planet did, so you may have seen it, but they had a scepter and an orb that was taken off of her coffin at the committal service at St. George's Chapel in Windsor. And that will then be presented to King Charles when he has his official coronation in the coming months. And that scepter is the thing that the, that the sovereign has. It's, it represents the right to rule. So what we have here is we have something again where we see God who is also king. And this God, man, king, Messiah is clearly, when we look at the rest of scripture, what is being pictured here. That, that Balaam has a vision of the Messiah like Isaiah did. And he sees the scepter of him ruling, and he sees him as a star coming forth. If there was any doubt that we should link this vision of God Almighty with the seed of the woman, man, then look at the very next phrase. He will crush through the forehead of Moab. 
Remember Genesis 3.15? He will crush your he his head and he will bruise his heel. That's the beginning of all of the seed of the woman, the humanity of the Messiah prophecies come from that verse. And that is a very clear allusion to that verse. Although here, the forehead being crushed is what? It's Moab. So if you just take a step back and look at the context of Numbers, Balak saying, I want you to go and curse Israel. And then in his final prophecy, he's saying, Moab's forehead will be crushed by the coming Jewish king. That's essentially what he's saying. Not what Balak was intending, methinks, but nonetheless, that's what he got. And so there is this destruction of Moab and Edom, which is in that range, Seir, which is a mountain within that area. That whole geographic region will become a possession while Israel performs valiantly. Mount Seir is the location of Bosra, and Bosra is the place that the Bible speaks of with regards to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 63, who is this who comes from Edom with blood on his garment? It is I who is mighty to save. Crushing his enemies he was as he saves them single-handedly. Well, is that Israel performing valiantly? Oh, Israel performed valiantly. They did the one thing they were supposed to do the whole way along that they never did throughout history and still haven't completely done. And that is that on that day, they will cry out to him and they will repent and they will mourn for him whom they have pierced as if he was their own son. And as they do that, he shall then return to them as they are holed up in this Bosra, which means sheepfold, a place where they are hiding from their impending final destruction. And then at the 11th hour, Christ will return to Edom. And as he comes back, four heads will be crushed. This is all from a Babylonian astrologer. Isn't this astonishing? What a privilege. And by the way, can you see what Matthew is doing here in the theme of the gospel that we've seen so far? That we had that genealogy with the Gentile references, with the immoral references, with the sort of, you know, reminding us that Jesus is not just son of David, Jewish Messiah. He's son of Abraham who will bring blessings to all nations. This is a blessing to another nation. There's a Babylonian Magi who's giving very important prophecies concerning the Messiah of Israel right at the time that he was hired to curse them. So we now know how it's possible that Babylonian Magi would associate the coming of the Messiah with a star. Well, that's one problem solved, but it doesn't solve them all. Because we now have to ask ourselves, how would these Babylonian Magi come to know of this particular previous Babylonian Magi's writing or his, his prophecy and having, having come to that understanding, why on earth would they want to worship him? And for that we need to turn to the book of Daniel. So go to Daniel 2. Many of you were here while we taught through Daniel earlier in the year, so some of this will be a, ref a refresher for some of you. Others of you weren't here and you can just jump in with us now in Daniel 2. I don't want to recount the entirety of the book of Daniel, but just as a very brief overview, Daniel went out in the first of three waves of the Babylonian captivity. He was taken along with other of the young, uh, young males who were considered to be the future of Israel. They came from homes of royalty. They came from homes of, of prosperity, homes of leaders of Israel. They were the, uh, the creme de la creme, as it were, of the next generation of Israel. They were the ones that Israel's future were, was to be built upon. So when the Babylonians came in to make sure there was no uprising, they took the ones who were most likely to uprise and they enrolled them by force into, a, into the uh, University of Babylon, so to speak, where they would be trained in Babylonian ways. And so they took these maybe older teenager kind of age people, they took them and they put them in the king's court, and like the rest of those who were in the king's court, they would have been castrated. Daniel did not have a good time. Castrated, 
taken out of his land, away from his family, never to return, to go and be a eunuch in the courts of Babylon, in the midst of idolatry. Because Israel, who had loved idolatry so much, was about to get an overdose of idolatry for the next 70 years. And so Daniel is taken to Babylon, and there he does his absolute best. And this bizarre thing happens at the end of chapter 1, where we're told that Daniel was just ahead of everybody else. And Daniel has this understanding of dreams and visions in verse 17 of chapter 1. But he and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they became known while they were there, he and his friends were, were renowned as being those who excelled. God gave them knowledge and insight in every branch of literature and wisdom. In other words, they're taken to Babylon to study the, 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 the works of the Magi to become astrologers and astronomers, to do this sort of occultic science quasi-hybrid thing that they did, the Chaldeans did in Babylon, to be part of that Chaldean school. And we are told specifically that they excelled at it. Do you know there are Christians out there who love the Lord God with all their heart and mind, who are experts in Mormonism, Islam, and other such false faiths. And I'm so glad that there are those that God has raised up to study such things. And Daniel was able to study those things without compromising his faith. He wouldn't be able to practice those things, but he was able to become an expert, and that is exactly what he did. And the end of Daniel 1 seems to suggest to us that Daniel was sort of, uh, what do they call it, Kuma laude, whatever, something, you know, magna laude. He was the top of the class, on the dean's list. That I do understand. He was on the dean's list. He came out top of class in Babylon. And so he enters into the Chaldean school. Then in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he has a dream, and he says, hey, Chaldeans, hey, you magi, hey, you experts in these kind of things, I need you to interpret a dream for me. No problem, Neb. We got this. Interpreting dreams, that's one of the things that we do. Tell us your dream, we'll interpret it for you. And he goes, ah, no, 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 no. I got your number on this one. I know what you're up to. If I, if I tell you that I, you know, if I, I, I was standing up in court and I, and I seemed to be naked, then you'll say, ah, oh, that's something to do with your mother. And oh, I, was, I was falling, I was trying to fly and I was, couldn't fly and I was falling. Ah, something to do with your father. You, you'll, you'll play that sort of game that people play and you can make it up as you go along. For me to be sure that the interpretation is right, you will also tell me what the dream is. And of course they couldn't do it. And so Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and his fury, sounds a bit like Herod, he decides he's going to kill all of the Chaldeans. Kill the lot of them. Them and their families will all be slaughtered. And so they are gathering them up to slaughter them. And then Daniel is suddenly aware of this. Now you can tell he's the new boy, can't you? You can tell he's just graduated because he wasn't brought before the king to give an answer. He's just one of the others that are going to be rounded up to be killed. And he says, you know, what's going on here? Why are you going to kill me? And the answer was, well, you know, this is what's happened. The dream, blah, blah, blah. And Daniel says, I'll give him the answer to the dream. Give me a night, give me until tomorrow, and I will give him the answer. Which is a good strategy, because even if he didn't get an answer, he still gets one more night's sleep. Nothing to lose at this point, right? So Daniel goes to sleep, and before he does so, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who don't have this, this gift, they are able to pray with him. And so they prayed, and God gave Daniel not only the interpretation, but he also gave him the dream. And thus Daniel saves the day, and the dream, by the way, speaks of the various Gentile kingdoms that will rule over Israel. And right where we are now in Matthew's Gospel, we've just reached the fourth Gentile kingdom, the beginning of it, that Daniel prophesied. So this is all connected together. And so Daniel then gets a reprieve. And not only does he get a reprieve, but he becomes the leader of the Chaldean school. He becomes the leader of the Chaldean school. And I would have imagined he's a fairly popular leader because they're all breathing because of him, right? So what do we have? We have a man who is a prophet of God who is in charge of schooling 
all the Babylonian magi. And we know that he had access to earlier scripture in memory, if not physically, when he came, because he alludes to the book of Job in what he says in chapter 1 of Daniel, which we, we mentioned when we did Daniel 1. Now he has money and power and influence, and he can teach them what he likes. And so I imagine he said, let's go get a copy of the book of Numbers. There's a Babylonian magi there we need to study. And so we can understand that there may well have been in the centuries following a stream of Chaldeans who came to faith through the ministry of Daniel, who was a leader in the Chaldean school, a representative in Babylonian government until the end of that empire when the Medo-Persians came in and he had a similar role then as well. And so Daniel had this great influence, and I imagine he had copies of Isaiah, he had copies of Jeremiah, which had just been written prior to the time he went out. He had copies of the Pentateuch, the, the books of the law. He'd have had copies of Job. He would have got whatever he could have done. And I don't think there would have been a limitation with regards to his wealth, with regards to what he was able to get, and what he was able to have then copied as well. And Daniel would have been training them up. And it's no surprise that there would be some that would pass their faith on to subsequent generations and that there were many of Daniel's mindset within the Babylonian Magi. So what do we have so far? We're almost there. We have, we have Magi who have a history with the Jewish God, who have a reason to worship him and have a connection that his coming will be associated with a star. What we don't have is how they know that on this particular time, this particular star means that they should leave and go and see him, that he's now here, however many centuries, four, five hundred years later. In fact, it might be more like 600 years later. So how do they know that now's the time? For that, we just have to turn a few more pages to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, at the end of that, there is the passage of chapter 20, uh, verse 24 of chapter 9, when Gabriel comes and tells Daniel he's highly esteemed and he has a message for him. He's been held up by uh, various things, but now he comes and he has a message. And his message concerns 70 weeks. Now, there is absolutely no way in the approximately seven minutes that I have to deal with this passage to do it justice. So I'm afraid that those of you who weren't here for Daniel 9, I referenced to you our studies in Daniel 9, which you'll find on the church website, which were done earlier this year. But we can have a very brief look and see that 70 weeks have been determined for your people. In other words, for Israel, not for the church, not for anybody else, but for Israel, who were his people. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and your holy city. That would be Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to make an end for sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy of holies. That sounds like a good list, doesn't it? What's going to happen is that prophecy will be fulfilled. Sin will come to an end, at least for Israel. Their sins will be atoned for, and there will be a kingdom everlasting righteousness that will come in, and the anointing of the Holy of Holies. That sounds like the kingdom that they've been waiting for. How long are we going to have to wait for this? 70 weeks. Now, the word week has already been used in Daniel and elsewhere in Scripture to reference, um, we, we say the word week, which of course for us means seven days, right? But it literally means sevens, which the word sevens is how they communicated weeks, and that's how the word week has come into our sort of uh, uh, tradition of translation. But it literally means sevens in the same way that, you know, a dozen is 12, is, is this word means sevens. So there'll be a groups of sevens, and these are periods of seven years. So we have 70 periods of 70 years. Now, again, I haven't got time to go into it in depth, but what happens is that we have a very brief breakdown where the 
Uh, you are to know verse 25 and have insight that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So there's a period of seven plus 62, which is 69 weeks. The mathematicians here are already ahead of the rest of us, and they're coming up with the fact that it's 483 years, I think that is. Uh, I don't have that written down. If I'm, if I'm right, that's my math, so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with myself at this point. But I think that's 483 years. And that is going to be from point A to point B. Point A is the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which remember at the time of Daniel is now in ruins and has been destroyed and they are in exile. When the word comes to rebuild, from there until the coming of Messiah is going to be a total of those 483, I think, years. Now that last 70th week is separated, and the reason why comes through partly in the text and partly in the context of Daniel. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So there is a definite point. We have the seven weeks, and that's to do with the rebuilding uh, the first seven, then the 62 follow immediately afterwards, and after that 62 weeks, now we have an end point. The, there's the Messiah, and he's going to be cut off and have nothing. That's when the heel of the seed of the woman will be bruised. And the people of the prince who is to come, there's a ruler, prince just means ruler, who is to come, and the people of that prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We live at a time in history when the Messiah has come, those seven and 62 periods of seven years have been fulfilled, and... The people have come and destroyed the city and the sanctuary, and that was, second time round, not Babylonians, but Romans in 70 AD. That was all destroyed. Its end will come with a flood, symbolic, and it references uh, an army coming in like a flood, military might, and even to the end there'll be war, desolations are decreed. So you have this destruction with a flood, but then there will be war going on after that to the end. So it's clear that the 62 weeks kind of marks an end. And he, verse 27, the nearest antecedent is not the Messiah. The he goes back to something closer than that, which is the prince. It is the people of the prince who is to come. There's somebody who is of Rome. Whether that is genetically, racially, whether they are Italian or descended from, that, from the Roman people in that kind of way, or whether it simply means they are of the same form of government. The, the fourth kingdom is an imperialism that began with Rome and continues in part to this day. We're not sure exactly, but there is one that's going to come from those people, and he will be a ruler, and that ruler will make a firm covenant with the many, in the context that's Israel, for one week. And so there's going to be a seven-year covenant. In the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant. Abominations will be made desolate, and so on and so forth. That last covenant with that ruler, that has not yet happened. And the reason that has not yet happened is very important for us to understand. When Rome was destroyed, something in around about the same time happened that is incredibly significant. And we're going to see that in Matthew's Gospel as we go forwards. In Matthew's Gospel, there are a very important sequence of events. The Jews reject the king and his offer of a kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. They were offered the kingdom and they reject the kingdom. Because of that, Jesus judicially places blindness upon them. We'll see that in Matthew 13. He curses them and says that they have committed the unforgivable sin in their rejection of him. It is an unforgivable sin, not that any individual can do anything they won't be forgiven for, but for them as a nation, there is now no turning back. They are entering a period of blindness. And what does God do in this period? He creates the church. And he starts, he sends the disciples out at the end of Matthew's gospel and he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And now the church, it begins and God is predominantly saving Gentiles and not Jews. 
The 70 weeks for the Jewish people ended at 69, but they have a week to come. Paul tells us in Romans 11 that God is waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in, and then all Israel will be saved, which is what will happen at the end of the 70th week. So there's your brief potted summary of Daniel 9, 24 to end. Why is that relevant to us? Because we know that when the, when the permission is given to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, that the clock starts ticking. And in 483 years' time, the Messiah is going to come. And then at that time, what do they do? They look up and they see a star. Why is this one special? Well, they study the stars. They know, oh, that's Jupiter. Well, they didn't call it Jupiter, but you know what I mean. That's this, that's this, that's this, that, that, these stars. We know these. What's that strange thing? And thus they see a star, and that star leads them to Jerusalem, and then they show up in Jerusalem to worship King of the Jews. I think we've answered all of our questions. And with that, we'll end on this thought. Right from the beginning of this gospel, Jesus is the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham who was told that a great nation would come from him, but Abraham who was told that all nations would be blessed by him. Jesus is the one who, as son of David, will fulfill the promises of the Jewish Messiah. He will be their Jewish king. He will establish the Jewish kingdom. He will fulfill the promises to the Jews ultimately. But he will also bless the nations. And thus it is that we who are not Jewish, that we set, sit here today, if indeed we are saved, we sit here today redeemed by the blood of a Jewish Messiah, experiencing the spiritual blessings of salvation that come through a new covenant, a covenant that was promised to Jewish people. Jewish Messiah, Jewish covenant. Not our party. And yet we, like wild branches, have been grafted on to the blessings of God and to experience the blessings that were promised to them. And Matthew's gospel again and again and again is going to nudge and point us to Gentiles being blessed. Gentiles like Balaam, who was a Babylonian astrologer who got to prophesy and see a vision of the Messiah. Gentiles, like, who do we have in the, uh, in the genealogy, like Tamar, like Ruth, like Bathsheba. These Gentiles who were, were part of the heritage of Israel. And how did God lead his chosen nation, Israel, through the wilderness? How do they know where to go in their wilderness wanderings? He led them by a cloud and by fire by a bright shining they were led they were led from Egypt across the Red Sea and through the wilderness and into the promised land by the glory of God and that glory of God dwelt in the temple until because of their sin he departed from the temple that the temple could be destroyed and they could be taken into Gentile captivity and thus enter a period that Daniel calls the time of the Gentiles and that time continues on to this day. And so it is that that same glory that was so central to Israel until they blew it, that glory returned in Luke's gospel to Jews on a mountainside, humble shepherds watching their flocks. And there they were, and the glory God shone around. I promised I wouldn't teach Luke. Darn it. <laughs> Trying to stick to Matthew. But that's just magnificent. Prophet Ezekiel tells us that the glory of God left the Holy of Holies because of the sins of Israel. That's why when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple, nobody had their face melted by walking into the presence of God. Then when they rebuilt the temple, 
when the command went out from Cyrus to go and rebuild and restore, prophesied here in Daniel 9, when that command went out and they rebuild, the prophet Haggai tells us that the glory of the latter temple was not as great as the former. God wasn't in the temple second time round, not until John chapter 2, when Jesus walks into the temple and says to them, destroy this temple, I rebuild it in three days. Because now his body is the temple. And so, for the first time since Ezekiel, for the first time for 600 or so years, the glory of God returns to Israel in the presence of humble shepherds on a mountainside. But even more astonishing than that, coming back to Matthew, the glory of God, which is what I believe that star was. Not a literal star, they'd have seen that star. They'd have seen the star in the sky. They knew what the stars were. They knew the courses of the stars. Stars, by the way, don't hover over houses. <laughs> star, star, houses tend to get burnt up when stars get close. That this is, you know, star is a word that was used to describe something that was bright and shining in the sky. And they see something bright and shining in the sky, so what are they going to call it? I guess they're going to call it a star. And the star appears in the sky, a bright shining appears in the sky. And they're like, aha, Numbers 24, 17. This is it. This is what we've waited for. And, and for, for generations since the time of Daniel, there must have been Babylonian magi who had raised their families, Babylonians impacted by their ministry, who had believed in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And they were told... We have a special prophecy that came to one of our own concerning the timing of the arrival of the king of the Jews. What would you have done if you had been part of a tradition that had waited for centuries for one event to happen? Know what I'd have been doing. I'd have been packing my bags and getting on, on the next horse convoy to, uh, to Jerusalem. And that's why I think there were hundreds or perhaps even thousands that showed up. Because who's going to miss that thing? We've been waiting for it for hundreds of years. And so they show up to go and worship the king of the Jews because the same glory of God that has reappeared with the coming of Christ to the nation of Israel has also come to the nations. That's why people like you and me get to worship the king of the Jews just like they did. Hopefully you didn't have to travel a year to get here today, but they were prepared to go a long way to worship their God, their Messiah. Not theirs by birth, but theirs by faith. May we too see no limits in our worship of the Jewish King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you for this glorious passage of scripture. All the Old Testament connections and illusions. Thank you, Lord, that we are a people who have been blessed to come at a time when not only do we have your glory dwelling within us through your Holy Spirit, but we have the completed canon of scripture that we might see your completed revelation to man. What a privileged time for us to live in. And Lord, I pray that we would be inspired by the journey of the Magi. That you took those men who came from a background of idolatry and immorality, saved them by faith, and led them to worship Christ. We too have been saved from immorality and idolatry. That we would come and worship the King of the Jews. May we see no limits. May we not say this is too far, this is too hard, this is too much. But may they inspire us to live a life that is worthy of the calling by which we've been called. To worship our Jesus, our Messiah, extravagantly to pour out our lives as a drink offering to hold nothing back to put aside sin 
cast aside distractions and wholeheartedly give every ounce of our being, every breath that you bestow upon us for every day that you give us to the worship of our King. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.